Senator, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am pleased to present today's Senate Bill 692, which establishes regulations for former members and employees of the California Gaming Control Commission or Bureau of Gambling Control when they are seeking employment as a consultant or key employee of a gambling, gambling establishment. Under current law, previous members and employees of the Bureau and Commission are barred from acting as, as an agent for an entity that has a business before the Bureau or the Commission. While there are regulations in place to stop the revolving door for past members and employees not to directly lobby the Bureau and Commission, there is no revolving door prohibition on members and employees who go to work as consultants or key employees of a gambling establishment. Over the years, former Bureau employees have resigned and immediately started consulting with casinos and card rooms. SB 692 would establish regulations to help prevent this from occurring. I have with me Jared Blanian from the Communities for California Card Rooms who would be able to answer any questions that you may have. Very good, thank you. Um, Good Mr. morning, Blanian. Mr. Chair and members. Jerry Blanion on behalf of Communities in, for California Card Rooms. Um, here to uh, give our support to SB 692. Um, we feel this bill is necessary to uh, protect the industry from the perception of dishonesty and self dealing. And uh, thank you, the author, for uh, bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Are there, uh, you here in support, sir? Yes, Reverend Butler from the California Coalition Against Gambling Expansion in Support. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Uh, members? Sen uh, Senator Weso. Well, just generally, I wanted to ask if the um, if somebody serves on this, uh, it's a commission or the board. Uh, if they serve it, and after they leave, uh, and they pursue employment, does the FPPC regulation apply to them as well, where they have a one-year uh, cool period, period, cooling off period? Um, no, it does not. So does this bill address that? Yes, so this bill would address um, employees. It's prior, two years prior. Two years after, they're, they're, after they leave office, they would not be able to be hired by a card room for two years. What if they were employed before? If they were and then they employed get by a to card board. room prior to and then hired by the state? Mm -hmm. There's a, an addition prohibition against that for um, appointed. You, so you can't be appointed to the commission if you worked with the industry prior and you couldn't work um, in the, the higher levels of the bureau if you worked. I before. see, and it provides that a person is eligible for appointment if within two years prior to the appointment, the person was employed by, retained by, or derived substantial income from gambling establishment. So it, it addresses the two years prior. Right. I just don't see the one year following in the bill, it doesn't. There's an existing piece of legislation, um, business and professions code, um, I believe it's. So there is already a law, yes. That's well, that was my question. That's, that is all where your law That's one that year addresses after. that one year cooling off period. That's all I wanted to know, very well, yes. thank you. Two the, years prior and one year after, which is, I, I don't know that, I don't know necessarily that we have a two years prior provision in other commissions or appointments, but. This would an ad ad establish an additional requirement than other commissions. Right, the existing law only applies mm -hmm. to members of the commission appointed. Um, it doesn't deal with the um, high ranking officials who aren't appointed. And it also doesn't prevent them from acting as key employees or working for the establishment. It just prevents them from lobbying the commission. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, I guess question, why to you? I mean, everything else um, seems to be one year after. You know, it, it, we're, it falls we're, in line with uh, other gaming jurisdictions, such as Nevada and New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey has four years, Nevada has two years. Um, we feel this is the proper amount of time to prevent against um, dishonesty and self healing. So the, so the two years is an industry standard for the gaming industry. Yeah. All right, any other? Uh, is there any uh, other questions from the members and readiness? I'll move the bill. All right. Appropriate. The bill's been properly moved. Uh, Mr. Vidak, you're close. Uh, I ask for your vote. Thank you. Uh, please call the roll. Motion is due pass and we refer to appropriations. Hall? Aye. Hall, aye. Berryhill? Aye. Berryhill, aye. Block? Gaines? 
Calgiani. Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez I. Hill. Aye. Hill I. Weso. Aye. Weso I. Lara. Aye. Lara I. McGuire. Vidak. Aye. Vidak I. All right. We have the bill has seven votes, but we're going to keep it open for the absent okay. members as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Senator Liu has a bill up. She's out today. I believe her chief of staff, Suzanne Reed, is present to present. Uh, please come forward. While she's coming forward, well, we'll do that later. Okay, please come forward. Come on. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Senators. Thank you for accommodating uh, Senator Liu. Um, she remains home and ill, and we hope. For her return, I especially hope for her return very quickly. Um, I am Suzanne Reed. I'm Chief of Staff. On behalf of Senator Liu and her principal co-author, Assembly Member Cheryl Brown, I am presenting SB 547, a bill that implements several of the recommendations that come from the Senate Select Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care Report, a shattered system reforming long-term care in California. This measure creates an Assistant Secretary of Aging and Long-Term Care coordination <coughs> within the Health and Human Services Agency. It requires the Health and Human Services Agency under the direction of the Assistant Secretary to develop, to develop a state and system-wide long-term care plan and creates the Department of Community Living within the Health and Human Services Agency to integrate the administration and delivery of aging and long-term care services and supports now distributed among seven different departments. Uh, the um, bill is uh, an anchor in a 25-bill package on aging and long-term care um, reform that is moving um, on both the Assembly and the Senate side at this time. Members, our current state's um, population of 65 years and older individuals will grow from about 13% now to almost 20 percent, that is one in five Californians in 2030. Our state is not prepared for this silver tsunami. After a year of in-depth research and public hearings, silver the Senate tsunami. Select Committee came to the same conclusions presented in six different reports over the last 20 years. California's aging and long-term care system is fragmented and almost impossible for consumers, caregivers, and providers to navigate. When consumers can't identify and access necessary home and community-based services, there is an increased likelihood of more costly hospitalization and institutional placement. The state disarray of services and supports also extends to the regional and local levels. The result is inequity in access, for example, between ur urban and rural settings, and no coordinated oversight or accountability across programs. The purpose of SB 547 is to produce better coordination and administration and delivery of programs and services and better communication among program staff, not only within the new department and throughout the agency internally, but also across agencies. The Assistant Secretary of Aging and Long-Term Care, in addition to being responsible for intra-agency program coordination and collaboration, would be expected to coordinate closely with the federal government to maximize alignment of programs and federal dollar drawdowns. More cohesive state structure will support more collaboration and capacity building at the regional level. Properly Im implemented reorganization will yield cost savings and efficiency for the state and regions. Consumers will have more choices and improved ability to remain in their homes and communities. Beginning now to develop and implement a state long-term care plan with goals, strategies, benchmarks, and deadlines will enable California to meet the needs of its growing population in a rational manner rather than respond in crisis mode. Members, this is not a simple bill, but it is a straightforward one. This chart, which is there, and of which you should have a copy in front of you, that looks like this? Good. Um, 
represents our current aging and long-term care system. What we see is 112 <coughs> aging and long-term care programs spread over 20 agencies and departments. If this were a business with a high level of consumer dissatisfaction the select committee encountered in the field, the Board of Directors would demand a complete overhaul and reorganization immediately. Members, the legislature is the Board of Directors. By passing 547, you will demand better delivery of services and supports for California consumers and on behalf of the shareholders who are the taxpayers of the state. With me today are um, witnesses in support, Sandy Fitzpatrick, the Executive Director of the California Commission on Aging, and Teresa Fafuzzi, the Executive Director of the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Sandy? Good okay. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the California Commission on Aging is designated in state law as the principal advocate on behalf of older Californians, and we strongly support SB 547. There's a big reason for California to plan for an aging population. 1,000 Californians turn 65 every day and will continue to do so for the next 17 years. Every person in the state and in this room faces a 70% risk of needing some level of long-term support in their lifetime. Will you know where to turn? In the report by the Senate Select Committee, the critical issues facing our care system included fragmentation, lack of coordinated oversight, and accountability. Recent reorganization at the federal level created the Department of Community Living. And at the local level, in many of your districts, there are actually models of aging and adult services integration that work quite well. What's missing is a similar paradigm at the state level. Establishing a cabinet level position will give policies around aging and independent living the prominence and the attention that they have long deserved. Funding and service silos have been a documented problem for years. One example might be residential care oversight that spread across four separate departments. Why are caregiver services operated out of two departments? And as one of my colleagues testified recently, we must reinvent the service experience in terms of person-centered care, processes, and outcomes. Personally and professionally, for over 30 years, I have helped and seen older adults, families, caregivers, and even myself with those years of experience struggle to identify services, comprehend the eligibility grid, determine availability, and then identify how I'm going to even access the service. The Commission believes that 547 reflects a better approach and is the answer to address the current system shortfall and plan for the future needs of today's and tomorrow's consumers and their caregivers. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Favuzzi. I'm the Executive Director of the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Um, we provide services for over 100,000 uh, people with disabilities annually. Uh, currently, California has a very fragmented system of services that are offered to people based on age, disability, or diagnosis. If you are not the right age, you, are not, you don't have the correct disability or diagnosis, you can find yourself stranded. We need to develop a system that is from birth to death that meets people's access and functional needs. Uh, if a person needs a ramp in order to remain living at home, it shouldn't matter how old they are, it shouldn't matter what disability they have, they should just have the opportunity to work with someone to understand what their options are and how to get or build a ramp so that they can live independently and move on with their lives. This legislation moves us in that direction. It gets us in alignment with the Administration for Community Living at the federal level and positions California to capture additional federal dollars. It's important also to note that it changes the dialogue and the emphasis of a multitude of programs by providing leadership and a mission that drives our services towards community living something we've been striving for in California since the Olmstead decision. This legislation has the potential to increase efficiencies through proactive collaboration and coordination on multiple levels, and we feel it will lead to better outcomes 
for people with access and functional needs of all ages. We believe it's time to innovate, take on this leadership, and we respectfully request your support of SB 547. Thank you. Uh, other witnesses in support, please come forward uh, very briefly. <clears throat> the senators have to go to other committees. Rebecca Curley on behalf of the California Retired Teachers Association. We are in support of this bill. We believe that it will address the complexity of the administrative spider web for long-term care services and help make progress towards rationalizing our long-term care services. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Yes, Daryl Kelch with the California Association of Area Agencies on Aging, representing uh, those that serve older people throughout the state. Those in the aging community have known for a long time that the system is broken. We've also realized that change needs to be made, and we believe SB 547 is a significant step in that direction. We have long been disappointed that we have not been able to get change because some people feel that change is inconvenient and they also have self-interest. We don't believe these are the reasons to oppose changing the system. So we urge you to, to have an aye vote for the bill and pass it. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Okay. Uh, com comments from the committee. Senator Barry Hill. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know Carol's worked really hard on this bill. I think it does have some merit. But having said that, I think the cost of this thing is going to be huge. I'm not sure that we know exactly in this, even in this bill as it sits here today, that we know how to implement it fully. Uh, we are absolutely creating a new agency. And it seems to me the Health and Human Services are supposed to be coordinating this as we sit here. Now, other than those concerns, I love this bill. Uh, <laughs> But, but uh, I, I think seriously that, that uh, it's, not, it's not fully cooked. And I think that there's maybe a way to get to yes. I don't think, it just, I don't think it's quite there yet. So I'm not going to be able to support it today. But hopefully uh, we can continue to work on this and we can get it right in the next year. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, mean, I, I agree. I think this is, this is great. And, and I, I'll support it today. My only concern is the county, San Mateo County, where I come from, we've got a very successful coordinated care initiative that is, and I want to make sure that there's, they haven't had a chance to really look at it. So I'm supported today and may not in the future, but hopefully I will. So I just, thank you. All right. Any other comments, concerns? Um, I have just a few. I am 100% in support of this bill. My mother would kill me if I said otherwise. <laughs> so let's get that settled. My mother is watching at home, I'm sure. Just want to put that in the atmosphere. Thank <laughs> you. But um, where is the, uh, the governor on this? Has he weighed in on this? Uh, we have been the administration. In, uh, not in direct discussion with the governor who um, actually uh, to reveal, um, I and the senator and the governor all fall into this category that one of these. He's seventy-seven. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we're we're not that far behind. So um, we haven't heard directly from the governor, but um, the senator did present the report to Secretary Dooley before we released it publicly and discussed the the programs um, that were being proposed here with her, um, and invited her interaction on as we move forward uh, with the bill. I did want to respond to a couple of the comments, if I may, from the members. Y yes. So we don't have a position from the governor yet. We're going to work on that as we get closer. Hopefully down the road, we're double referred. Um, but also, I, I just wanted to point out that um, we have not prescribed how the reorganization should take place. That <laughs> process of reorganization would actually take place after the assistant secretary is appointed. And so this is more an organic process to figure out how best to align the services and save the most money and deliver the services most efficiently. San Mateo is definitely um, one of the role models in uh, regional organization, and it was part of the statewide tour that the senator took of best practices um, in terms of their um, thinking in, with respect and implementation of the coordinated care initiative. So the bill provides that 
will take all the good work and best practices that have been done and apply them to a systematic and rational system reorganization. Okay. Um, how many employees are in the department right now? <laughs> Lots. 